Welcome to the Northbound Wealth Podcast. All opinions expressed by me, my co-hosts, or my guests are solely our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Northbound Wealth Management. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as personalized recommendations or fiduciary advice. It is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for any investment, accounting, legal, and tax advice or as a solicitation to offer or buy any securities. Clients of Northbound Wealth Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. Today is December 19th, 2023. Today might be the day that the S&P 500 hits an all-time high. Futures are pointing to like oh over 4,800 for the S&P. So what does that mean? Well, we'll go over that. So stay tuned. Um, all right. So big day, last podcast of 2023. The next podcast release is going to be in 2024 in January. And I just want to wish all of you a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, and all the rest of the holidays. Enjoy your time with friends and family. Be safe on your travels. And uh, let's dive in to reviewing last week and what's going on and what's transpiring. Actually, probably going to happen today, uh, which is a big deal. So uh, last week... This is our 64th episode, by the way. Pretty awesome, huh? We'll just keep this bad boy rolling. Uh, Weekly market insights, stocks rally on the Fed and inflation news. This was last week. We we always review last week. And then we kind of talk about what's going on now. Uh, Markets reacted positively last week to cooler inflation and the idea of potential rate cuts next year. Uh, Adding to the gains of the market's year-end rally, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 2.92%, while the S&P 500 gained 2.50%. The NASDAQ Composite Index picked up 2.85% for the week. The MSCI EFA Index, which tracks developed overseas stock markets, tacked on 2.75%. Substantially broader rally right across the board. What does that mean for the Dow? We always cover that. It closed at 37,305. Year to date, that's up 12.54%. NASDAQ closed at 14,813. That's up 41.54%. The MSCI EFA index closed at 2,197. That's up 13.04%. The S&P 500 closed at 4719 and change. That's up 22.91% for the year. The 10-year treasury note was down to 3.91% after hitting 5% just a few months ago. So um, as you can tell, there's a a rally in the stock market because of that. The rally continues. Stocks gathered momentum last week after upbeat news from two key inflation reports, but the outcome of the FOMC meeting on Wednesday powered the week's advance. The combination of the FOMC signaling three rate cuts in 2024 and dovish comments by Fed Chair Powell led to a sharp drop in bond yields and a spike in stock prices, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average closing above 37,000 and setting an all-time high. The rally continued the following day as beneficiaries of lower rate cuts, such as smaller capitalization stocks, so small cap stocks and real estate rallied, a solid retail sales number, which reflected a strong consumer and supported the soft landing thesis, also boosted enthusiasm. So uh, those of you who know and have been in markets long enough to know when there's so much enthusiasm, just be aware there's probably going to be a correction. All right. Inflation eases. Uh, The anxiously awaited read on November inflation came close to the market expectations with a 0.1% increase over October and a year-over-year increase of 3.1%. Core inflation, which excludes energy and food prices, came in a bit hotter, rising 0.3% month over month and 4% from a year ago. A 2.3% decline in energy costs helped offset 2.9% jump in food prices. Shelter prices remained stubbornly high, rising 0.4% from October and 6.5% from last November. The inflation news was better on wholesale prices, tracked by the PPI or the Producer Price Index, Uh, Producer prices were unchanged in November and higher by just 0.9% year over year, excluding energy and food. The monthly increase was also unchanged. 
So this week, key economic data that we're tracking, Tuesday, housing starts. So we'll get a read on the housing market Wednesday, consumer confidence, existing home sales, Thursday, GDP or gross domestic product, the jobs claims report, index of leading economic indicators, Friday, durable goods, orders, personal income and outlays, new home sales and consumer sentiment. So we'll get a fairly good read on how people are doing uh, right up into the holidays. So this week, notable companies reporting earnings, Tuesday, FedEx. Wednesday, Micron Technology and General Mills. And then Thursday, Nike. So tax tip for the week, tax benefit and credits, FAQs for retirees. Lots of questions can come up about income taxes after one is retired. Some common types of taxable income include military retirement pay, all are part of pensions and annuities, all are part of individual retirement accounts, unemployment compensation, gambling income, bonuses, and awards for outstanding work and alimony or prizes. A few examples of non-taxable income are veterans benefits, disability pay for certain military government related incidents, workers comp, and cash rebates from a dealer or a manufacturer of an item that you purchased. This information is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax advice. We suggest you discuss your specific tax issues with a qualified tax professional. And these tips were adapted from iris.gov. All right, on to the next segment. Before we get into the next segment, I just want to go through a list of people and institutions that I want to thank for making Northbound Wealth Management happen for not only myself, but for my clients. And um, I don't do this very often, but I think now that we're, gosh, uh, three years into Northbound Wealth Management's growth and firm, um, I'm just really excited about our future and and what it holds. And um, it can't and won't ever be possible without great teammates and good partners. So first of all, I wanna thank Tommy Townsend, um, he's our financial analyst intern. He helps support me in what I do. He's also a CFA candidate and I'm excited about his future. So thank you, Thomas. Um, we call him Tommy around here, but, uh, let's go through this list. Uh, Charles Schwab and company. They're our custodian. Big thank you to you guys. Can't do it without you. Uh, Forge Trust, an alternative custodian, which, uh, they, they custody assets for private equity and real estate investments that we've got here at Northbound and just want to thank you guys for doing a great job. Um, Orion, what probably one of my most important partners uh, as far as uh, data aggregation, app interface for clients and also reporting and billing and all that fun jazz. Uh, Salesforce Financial Services Cloud, uh, they're, they're, they're our CRM and uh, FMG uh, Suite, which is basically our content and our marketing firm that we work with, Shannon Phelps and teams. Thank you so much because it's more than just your team. It's the whole organization. Great job. Schwab Alliance, uh, client portals and Schwab data. Uh, I use it myself. Clients use it. And uh, thank you, Charles Schwab, for providing a great app and a great experience for our customers. Uh, Dale Foster, CPA. Uh, Leanne Prins and Dale Foster, thanks for tax and bookkeeping for Northbound Wealth Management. Uh, let's see, Indie Pod Lab, where we host the podcast, and uh, Matt Zapazotti, Tom Marquell for the work they do there. Microsoft Office, I know Microsoft does never get any shout outs, but shout out to you guys. Obviously, I use your guys' suite. I also use Google to some degree, but mostly Microsoft. Thank you so much for providing a great platform uh, for us to do business here. JP Morgan Asset Management uh, in Morgan Markets. Uh, Patrick Smith over there, my, my, my man Patrick, does a great job, keeps me up to date and up to speed on everything going on. And Dr. David Kelly with the Guide to the Markets. Eye on the Markets, I love all that stuff, that, that research, that data, that opinion, that thought. You guys are all thinkers. Great job. Uh, DPL Financial Partners, uh, I partner with them to uh, provide an insurance platform, uh, low cost, no load, no commission, basically low fee for uh, insurance. That would be life insurance, disability, all the rest of 
insurances that we offer at our firm. XYPN Planning Network, uh, Mike Kitzix and team and staff there, uh, they do a great job with keeping me uh, up to date and informed and uh, supporting the financial advisors, independent financial advisors, private financial advisors out there and RIA firms all around the country. It's a great membership. Love you guys. You guys do a great job. Keep it up. Smart RIA compliance. So they're, they do a great job too. Love it. Keeps me uh, up to speed on my compliance stuff. Orion planning, financial planning for my clients. Uh, that's part of the data aggregation and um, couldn't be here without you guys. Weaver Insurance Group, uh, Larry Weaver over there, commercial lines, personal lines. Great job, man. Keep it up. Stock charts, charting and technical analysis. Love that platform. I use it every single day. Morningstar Research, Black Ink IT, Doug Allgood over there at uh, for cybersecurity, managed IT solutions. Uh, if you guys are ever looking for anybody uh, to help you with your managed IT. Black Ink IT is it. Peach and Swartz and Weingart. John Weingart, thank you so much for doing tax work for us. Uh, Investors Business Daily, The Wall Street Journal, The Indianapolis Business Journal, The Daily Upside, Morning Brew, Investopedia, Reuters, Y Charts, Calendly for scheduling, Axios, State Street Global, Vanguard, BlackRock, JP Morgan, the Capital Group, Global X, Charles Schwab, Pacer, uh, ETFs, Defiance ETFs, Calamos, uh, Fidelity, American Funds, American Century Funds, uh, Pimco, Barons, T. Rowe Price, Federated Hermes, Lord Abbott, Clearbridge, Lincoln Financial Group, Invesco, uh, Vetify, Amplify ETFs, ProShares, and SS&C Advisors. Man, I just ran through that. Um, I know a lot of my clients out there are like, what in the world did he just run through? That, uh, my friends, is uh, is a group of great companies. And uh, and the list will continue to grow and it'll change. And um, But it is what makes North Mountain Wealth Management possible. And I couldn't do it without all of them. And uh, in, in creating an unbiased approach to wealth management and asset management and portfolio construction and implementation. And it, all of it goes together to help clients reach their goals and objectives in their life. And so it's, a, it's an amazing dichotomy. Oh, and last but not least, uh, the SEC, FINRA and uh, state regulators and compliance people in the regulation field don't ever get the, enough credit uh, from investment firms like ours who are doing the right thing. And so um, thank you for the work that you guys do. Uh, this, this whole financial community wouldn't be possible without having the exchanges and having the market makers and having the regulators and the lawmakers work together. So um, let's just keep this experiment going here in America. And I just want to thank Bloomberg for research and data and actually their morning show every morning. Um, most mornings I'm up at 4.45, I work out and uh, my wife can attest to this, that uh, the morning shows uh, that are on are academic in nature and talk about the markets and are very intelligent. So uh, really enjoy the morning shows at Bloomberg as well as the research articles and news that they put out. Uh, they're, it's in my opinion, one of, one of the best organizations out there on that and CNBC as well. Uh, they do an excellent job of sharing insights, data and information and keeping everybody up on the breaking news of the market and having intelligent thoughts and opinions about where things are headed. And so thank you, Bloomberg and CNBC for doing the work that you guys do. Great job. So here we go. This is the S&P 500 average return. An article written December 1st, 2023 by JB Maverick, reviewed by Julius Manson, Vicky Velasquez, fact-checked by her. What is the S&P 500 index? Well, <clears throat> It is a market capitalization weighted index of the 500 leading publicly traded companies in the U.S. While it's assumed its present size in name in 1957, 
The S&P 500 actually dates back to the 1920s, becoming a composite index tracking 90 stocks in 1926. The average annualized return since inception in 1928 through December 31st, 2022 is 9.81%. The average annualized return since adopting 500 stocks into the index in 1957 through December 31st, 2022 is 10.13%. The average annual return or ARR is the percentage showing the return of a mutual fund in a given period. In other words, it measures a fund's long-term performance. So it's a vital tool for investors considering a mutual fund or index fund uh, investment. So key takeaways of what I just went over. It's a market cap weighted index, 500 publicly traded companies in the U.S., the index acts as a benchmark of the performance of the U.S. stock market overall, dating back to the 1920s. The index has returned a historic annualized average return of around 10.13% since 1957. The inception through the end of 2022, it's even better now, given that 2023 looks like we're wrapping up uh, here in the coming days, weeks uh, in the market. The S&P 500 is up uh, 22% so far. Or so. While that average number may sound attractive, timing is everything. Get in at a high or get out at a relative low, and you will not, I repeat, not enjoy such returns. So, staying in the market is always a good idea and uh, managing risk that way. So, the history of the SP 500 uh, during the first decade after its introduction in 1957 and reflecting um, the economic expansion in the U.S. after World War II, the value of the index rose to slightly over 800. From 1969 to 1981, the index gradually declined to fall under 360 as a sign of high inflation. During the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession, the S&P 500 fell 56.8% from October 2007 to March of 2009. The S&P 500 bounced back from the crisis and continued its 10-year bull run from uh, March of 2009 to 2019 to climb to three, it climbed 330% at that point. The COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and the subsequent recession caused the S&P 500 to plummet over 15% in a very short period of time, uh, around 30% two to 35 trading days, give or take. The S&P 500 recovered during the second half of 2020, reaching several all-time highs in 2021, but dropped more than 1,500 points in 2022 before rebounding in October. And so far, 2023 has been a great year, and it's round trip those losses uh, from 2022. So, um, yeah, I could go through every single year or most years of the market. I won't do that. Uh, inflation does in, fa uh, in fact, uh, affect the S and P 500 returns. That's one of the major problems for most investments is inflation. That's why it's so important to get under control. Good job to the fed and to just the economy for fixing itself. We'll keep going with this market timing does affect annual returns. When you choose to enter the market, for example, the S&P 500 ETF, ticker symbol SPY, which mirrors the actual underlying holdings of the index. Um, that's one of the a major holding of our firm. Uh, it basically mirrors the index and duplicates whatever the index holds. Um, it performed very well for investors who bought between 1996 and 2000 but experienced a consistent downward trend from 2000 to 2002. Investors who buy during market lows and hold their investment or sell at market highs will experience larger returns than those who buy during uh, market highs, particularly if they sell during dips, right? Um, attempting to time the markets is not advised, particularly for beginning investors. You can be tactical though, uh, let me tell you that you can be tactical and trim when, when things are overheating. So that's why we do technical analysis. It's a, it's a good idea to do that. Stock purchase timing plays a role in returns, but there are long periods 
uh, between the lows and the highs. So it's also difficult to know or predict these events. For those who want to avoid the missed opportunity of selling during market lows, but don't want to risk uh, active trading, dollar cost averaging is also an option where you just basically save and invest over time and not worry about too much of the market timing aspects of it. The number of stocks listed in the S&P 500 index, 503, and the reason for that, the total number tends to vary because there are several companies with multiple share classes. These include Google, Meta Platforms, and Berkshire Hathaway, where they have maybe class A, B, or C shares, or both, or A and C shares or whatnot. Um, so you can invest in the S&P 500 index by um, basically investing not in the index itself, because you can't but you buy a ticker symbol like Vanguard's uh, VOO or State Street's SPY or BlackRock's IVV. And those are the the uh, e exchange-traded funds, passively managed exchange-traded funds that, that represent the index. So that's how you gain exposure there. Uh, those are the three largest. Uh, of course, Schwab has one as well, or Custodian has one. So we, we definitely... Uh, look at that. So to wrap up here, what is the average rate of return for the S&P 500 for the last 20 years? Over the past 20 years, 2020, excuse me, 2002 to 2022, the average annualized return on the S&P 500 is 8.14%. What is the average rate of return for the S&P 500 for the last 10 years? The average rate of return for the S&P 500 since 2012 is 12.74%. So does this return or the S&P 500 return include dividends? Good question. Um, as we talk about this calculus, it does not include dividends. However, you can find results by some analysts that include the dividends, such um, as the list put together by Oswath Darmondrian, a professor of finance of NYU Stern School of Business. He, he puts something out there. You can Google that. The bottom line is, there have been many ups and downs in the in the century of existence for the S&P, but generally the index has produced returns over the long run since inception. It's returned around 9.81%. You can invest in the S&P 500 using index funds and exchange traded funds that mimic the index. Um, and, and not, you know, obviously if you were to try to buy every company within the index, you'd spend quite a bit of money trying to do that. And then also, um, stay in the course when things get kind of volatile. So when the market goes up or down, just uh, making sure that your exposure is where it should be and uh, staying the course, staying invested over a long period of time and adding to those investments during downturns is not a bad idea, especially if you're in accumulation stage. So if you're looking for ways to maximize your retirement portfolios, your investment strategies, um, and you want uh, help with those things, please give us a call at Northbound Wealth Management, 317-399-1107. Be happy to talk to you about the S&P 500 along with other uh, aspects of portfolio management and construction. And uh, stay tuned for the next segment. We're going to talk about the Dow and then we're going to talk about the, uh, the NASDAQ and we'll go through that and then we'll wrap it up and be done. All right, stay tuned. Hey everyone, this is Brent Foster. And this is an article written about the Dow Jones Industrial Average. What is it? And we'll go through that in its entirety. Investopedia is the source article. Uh, and it was updated by the Investopedia team July 17th of 2023. So I know right away that it doesn't actually have the all-time highs, which happened about five, six days ago because the article hasn't been updated. But it's still relevant a lot of this background information is really cool to check out if you're not sure what the Dow Jones Industrial Average is because most financial press and media talk about the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500. Not in that order, but they do talk about them all the time. And so let's dive in. What is the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Well, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is a stock market index that tracks 30 large publicly owned blue chip companies trading on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. The Dow is named after Charles Dow, who created the index in 1896, along with his business partner, Edward Jones, also referred to as the Dow 30. The index is considered to be a gauge of the broader U.S. economy. So key points and takeaways. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, widely watched benchmark index in the U.S. for blue chip stocks. 
the Dow is a price weighted index that tracks 30 large publicly traded companies trading on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. The index was created by Charles Dow in 1896 to serve as a proxy for the U.S. Uh, broader economy. The, the Dow's composition can change over time based on economic trends. And the Dow divisor, which is something we'll go over, is a constant that, that was created to address the simple average issue in a price weighted index. Understanding the Dow Jones Industrial Average is the second oldest U.S. market after the Dow Jones Transport Average. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, or DJIA, was designed to serve as a proxy for the health of the broader U.S. economy, often referred to as the simply as the Dow. It's the, one of the most widely uh, watched markets out there in the world. Um, and it includes a range of companies. Uh, in the early 20th century, the performance of the industrial companies was typically tied to the overall growth rate of the economy. Uh, that cemented the relationship between the Dow's performance and the overall economy. Even today, for many investors, a strong performing Dow equals a strong economy, while weak performing Dow indicates a slowing economy. As the economy changes over time, so does the composition of the index. A component of the Dow may be dropped when a company becomes less relevant to current trends of the economy to be replaced by a name that better reflects the shift. For instance, a company may be removed from the index when its market capitalization drops because of financial distress. Stocks with higher share prices are often given greater weight in the index, so a higher percentage move in a higher priced component will have a greater impact on the final calculated value at uh, the Dow's inception, Charles Dow calculated the average by adding the prices of the 12 Dow component stocks and dividing by 12. The result was a simple average. Over time, there were additions and subtractions to the index that ha had to be accounted for, such as mergers and stock splits. Uh, at that point, a simple mean calculation no longer made sense. So the Dow divisor and index calculation the Dow divisor was created to address the simple average issue. The divisor is a predetermined constant that is used to determine the effect of a one-point move in any of the approximately 30 stocks that comprise the Dow. There have been instances when the divisor needed to be changed so that the value of the Dow stayed consistent. As of September 2023, the Dow divisor was 0.15172752595384. So might want to jot that down. Just kidding. Uh, just Google the article. Uh, the Dow is not calculated using a weighted arithmetic average or weighted average and does not represent its uh, component companies market cap, unlike the S&P 500. Rather, it reflects the sum of the price of one share of stock for all the components divided by the divisor. Thus, a one-point move in any of the components' stocks will move the index by an identical number of points. Um, there's a formula here on investopedia.com. You can check that out and learn more about how to do that calculus. And uh, let's see, an important note here. The S&P 500 has outperformed the Dow Jones Industrial Average on an annualized basis over the last three, five, and 10-year periods, FYI. Um, so since I just went over the S&P 500, I wanted to make sure that that was an important note uh, that was plugged in there for you guys. So the Dow Index Components. It launched in 1896 with just 12 companies, primarily in the industrial sector. They included railroads, cotton, gas, sugar, tobacco, and oil. The index grew to 30 components by 1928. Since then, it changed many times. The very first came three months after a 30-component index launched. The first large-scale change was in 1932, when eight stocks in the Dow were replaced. Hmm. The Dow is uh, reevaluated on a regular basis. Companies are replaced when they no longer meet the index listing criteria with those that do. Over time, the index has become a bellwether of the U.S. economy, reflecting economic changes. For example, U.S. Steel was removed from the index in 1991 and replaced by a building material company called Martin Marietta. And by the way, on, on a U.S. Steel note, uh, they were just sold to a Japanese company, and so U.S. Steel is no longer uh, as of like the other day in 2023. The major changes to the Dow in 1997 when Westinghouse Electric, Bethlehem Steel, 
Texaco and Woolworths were replaced by Travelers Group, Johnson and Johnson, Hewlett Packard and Walmart. In 1999, when Chevron, Sears Roebuck, Union Carbide and Goodyear Tire were dropped, while Home Depot, Intel, Microsoft and SBC Communications were added in their place. Walgreens Boots Alliance replaced General Electric in June of 2018. In August 2020, Salesforce, Amgen, and Honeywell were added to the Dow, replacing ExxonMobil, Pfizer, and Raytheon Technologies. Raytheon joined the Dow Jones Industrial Average earlier that year after United Technologies merged with Raytheon, so they were added back kind of indirectly. So Dow DuPont spun off. Here's a This is a fun fact. Dow DuPont spun off DuPont and was replaced by Dow Chemical in 2019 in the, uh, in the composite. Um, and, and so here's, uh, the, the actual companies, uh, as of September, 2023, we got 3M, American Express, Amgen, Apple, Boeing, Caterpillar, Chevron, Cisco, Coke, Dow. Uh, so, uh, the exchange, let's see, Goldman Sachs, the Home Depot, Honeywell, IBM, Intel, J and J, J.P. Morgan Chase, McDonald's, Merck, Microsoft, Nike, Procter and Gamble, Salesforce, the Travelers Companies, United Health Group, Verizon, Visa, Walgreens, Boots Alliance, Walmart, and the Walt Disney Company. So here are some historical milestones. March 15, 1933, the largest one-day percentage gain in the index happened during the 1930s bear market, totaling 15.34%. The Dow gained 8.26 points and closed at 6210. Holy cow, we've come a long way since the bottom in 1933. Uh, uh, Let's see, October 19th, 1987, also known as Black Monday, the largest one-day percentage drop took place. The index fell 22.61% in one day, guys. There was no evident explanation for the crash, although program trading may have been a contributing factor. September 17th, 2001, the fourth largest one-day point drop and the largest at the time took place on the first day of trading following the 9-11 attacks in New York City. The Dow dropped 684.81 points or about 7.1%. However, it's important to note that the index had been dropping before September 11th, losing more than 1,000 points between January 2nd and September 10th. The Dow Jones Industrial Average started to make traction after the attacks and regained all of what it lost, closing above 10,000 points for the year. May 3rd, 2013, the Dow surpasses the 15,000 mark for the first time in history. January 25th of 2017, the Dow closes above 20,000 points for the first time. January 4th of 2018, the index closes at 25,075 spot 13, the first close above 25,000 points. January 17th, just a little bit later, the Dow closed at 26,115 spot 65, the first close above 26,000. And then in February uh, the uh, 5th, 2018, the Dow falls a record 1,175 spot to one points. Worst down day that they've had. Let's see, uh, December 26th of 2018, the Dow records its largest one day point gain of 1,086 spot 25. July 11th, 2019, the Dow breaks 27,000 for the first time in history. February 12th of 2020, the Dow hits its pre-pandemic high of 29,551. March of 2020, the Dow Jones crashes with back-to-back record down days amid the global COVID-19 pandemic, breaking below 20,000 and falling 3,000 points in a single day amid several 2,000 and 1,500 up and down moves. It officially entered bear market territory on March 11, 2020, ending the longest bull market in history, which began back in March of 2009. November 16, 2020, the Dow finally breaks its pre-COVID-19 high, reaching 29,950, spot 44 points. November 24th of 2020, The Dow breaks the 30,000 point level for the first time, closing at 30,045 spot 84. July 2021, the Dow trades above 35,000 for the first time. And uh, let's see, November of 2021, the Dow trades above 36,000 for the first time. January 4th, 2022, the Dow hits an all-time high of 36,000. 799. And now as of 
today, the Dow is trading at 37,433. Um, and it has a new all time high. So what are the limitations of the Dow? Many critics of the Dow argue it does not significantly represent the state of the U.S. economy as it consists of only 30 large cap U.S. companies. They believe the number of companies is too small and neglects companies of different sizes. Many critics believe the S&P 500 is a better representation of the economy as it includes significantly more companies, 500 companies versus 30. Furthermore, critics believe that factoring only the price of a stock in the calculation does not accurately reflect a company as much as considering a company's market cap would. In this manner, a company with a higher stock price but a smaller market cap would have more weight than a company with a smaller stock price but a larger market cap, which would poorly reflect the true size of a company. So the Dow is a price-weighted index as opposed to being weighted by market cap. This means that stocks in the index with higher share prices have greater influence regardless if they are smaller companies overall in terms of market value. In a price-weighted index, a stock that increases from $110 to $120 will have the same net effect on the index as a stock that increases from $10 to $20, even though the percentage move for the latter is far greater than that of the higher price stock. This also means that stock splits can have an impact on the whole index, whereas they would not for a market cap weighted index. So what does the Dow Jones Industrial Average measure? 30 of the largest companies in the US. The bottom line is, is if you have any questions about investing in the S&P 500 or the Dow, or how to approach the Dow, or what to think about the Dow, give us a call, Northbound Wealth Management. And uh, stay tuned for this next segment about the NASDAQ, which it represents a lot of technology companies, kind of a new age. So. Uh, stay tuned for that. The next segment is going to be about the NASDAQ. What is the NASDAQ? The history and the financial performance as well as the NASDAQ 100. So this first aspect of the article written by Adam Hayes, Investopedia, July 11th, 2023, reviewed by Gordon Scott. And uh, what is the NASDAQ? Let's dive in. It's a global electronic marketplace for buying and selling securities. Its its name was originally an acronym for the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations. That's a mouthful. NASDAQ started as a subsidiary of the National Association of Securities Dealers, or the NASD, now known as the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA. NASDAQ was launched after the SEC urged uh, NASD to automate the market for securities not listed on an exchange. The result was the first electronic trading system. NASDAQ opened for business in 1971. Key takeaways, NASDAQ is an online global marketplace for buying and trading securities, the world's first electronic exchange. It operates 29 markets, one clearinghouse, five central securities depositories in the United States and Europe. Most of the world's technology giants are listed on the NASDAQ. There are more than 5,000 companies that are listed and traded on the exchange on a daily basis. Many of these companies are major technology companies such as Apple, Microsoft, There are two different markets that make up the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ national market and the NASDAQ small cap market. The uh, the national market facilitates the trading of large securities with while the small cap market involves the trading of smaller growth companies. The exchange operates 29 markets, enabling the trading of stocks, derivatives, fixed income and commodities in the US, Canada, Scandinavia and the Baltics. The company also runs a clearinghouse in five central securities depositories in the United States and Europe. And uh, its trading technology is used by 100 exchanges in 50 countries. Special considerations. The term NASDAQ is also used to refer to the NASDAQ composite. This is an index of more than 2,500 stocks listed on the NASDAQ exchange. This index includes some of the major technology giants such as Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta Systems, or Meta Platform, sorry, Amazon, Tesla. The composite closed at a record high of 16,5744 on November 19th, 2021. The index proceeded to drop more than 23%. From that point through April of 2022, the NASDAQ composites 13.3% decline in April of 2022, 
was its worst monthly drop since October of 2008, when the index lost 17.4% amid the global financial crisis. It closed at 13,787 on June 30th, 2023. And as of today, it's trading at 14,955. So not quite to the 16,000 level of, of November 19th of 2021. NASDAQ Inc., is listed on the NASDAQ stock market under the ticker symbol NDAQ and has been part of the S&P 500 since 2008. So the NASDAQ trading system, computerized trading system, was initially devised as an alternative to the inefficient specialist system, which was the prevalent model for uh, almost a century. Uh, the, The rapid evolution of technology has made the NASDAQ electronic trading model, the standard for markets worldwide. Uh, It was only fitting for the world's up and coming technology companies to list on an exchange using the latest technology. As the tech sector grew in prominence in the 1980s and 1990s, the NASDAQ Composite Index became its most widely quoted proxy. That turned NASDAQ Composite into the index of the dot-com boom and bust after rallying nearly 150% in the 16 months through March 2000, the NASDAQ composite then slumped 80% by October 2002. Here's some history. In November 2016, Chief Operating Officer Adina Friedman was promoted to the role of Chief, Chief Executive Officer, becoming the first woman to run a major exchange in the United States. Financial performance of the NASDAQ, they generate revenue from clients, including financial institutions, brokers, institutional investors, corporations. <coughs> the NASDAQ's revenue is mainly derived from fees charged for the following market services, which give investors access to various markets, investment intelligence, including data indices and investment analytics for financial institutions, brokers, and asset managers, market technology, which includes trading and settlement platforms, as well as technology safeguards against financial crime, and then corporate services, such as listing fees and investment relations services. NASDAQ reported a total income of $1.12 billion on total revenue of $6.23 billion for the 2002 excuse me, for the 2022 fiscal year ending December 31st, 2022, a multi-billion dollar exchange and index. Very, very prominent. So 5,000 companies that trade on the exchange, including domestic and international firms, it was the first automated exchange in the world. Now we'll dive into what is the NASDAQ 100. Um, And there's a ticker symbol called the Qs, QQQ, that mirrors the NASDAQ 100. So let's talk about it. The NASDAQ 100 is a large cap growth index. It's comprised of 100 of the largest U.S. and international non-financial companies, all of which are listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange based on their market cap. So it's a cap-weighted index, not a price-weighted index like the Dow. Some of the major companies included are Apple, Dollar Tree, Keurig, Sirius, XM Holdings, Zoom Video Communications. Investors who are interested in taking advantage of the index's returns can do so by investing in mutual funds, exchange traded funds, options, futures, and annuities that track and try to mimic its performance. So Apple, by the way, trades on the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol AAPL. Um, The company went public on December 12th, 1980, when it first traded at around $22. Apple stock closed at $190.25 on June 30th, 2023, after many splits, by the way. So Um, Bottom line, guys, the NASDAQ is one of the most important and major stock market exchanges in the United States, and um, they were open for business in 1971. The NASDAQ composite is 2,500 of those 5,000 companies of the world's most watched stock market indexes. It's definitely like one of the top gauges of the U.S. and global economies. So the NASDAQ 100 index, what is it and how is it weighted and traded? I, I kind of summarized a little bit of that. Um, and let's dive into so what is the NASDAQ 100. Um, it is a index, a stock index of the 100 largest companies by modified market cap trading on NASDAQ exchanges. So 
The index includes companies in basic materials, consumer discretionary spending, consumer staples, healthcare, industrials, technology, telecom, and utilities. The index excludes financial firms. So you won't see financial firms uh, listed in there. Companies included in the index are some of the largest in the world, such as Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, and Meta, which was formerly known as Facebook. Um, So the NASDAQ 100 is an index, so it cannot be directly invested in, but people can gain exposure through ETFs or exchange traded funds. I mentioned the Qs. QQQ is a ticker symbol for the NASDAQ 100 index. For, uh, let's see, for inclusion into the 100, indexed securities must be listed exclusively on a NASDAQ exchange. These can include common stocks, ordinary shares, or ADRs, or American Depository Receipts as tracking uh, stocks. They must also be non-financial and have traded for at least three months on an exchange. The NASDAQ 100's liquidity criteria require that each security have a minimum average daily trading volume of 200,000 shares measured over the previous three calendar months. There is no market capitalization requirement. The NASDAQ 100 index is constructed with a modified capitalization method, which uses the individual weights of included items according to the market cap. Uh, Weighting limits the influence of the largest companies and balances the index among all members. NASDAQ reviews the composition of the index each quarter and adjusts the weights if the distribution requirements are not met. So what are the composition as of September 30th, 2023? The composition would be technology 57.1%. Nearly 60%. Consumer discretionary, 18.73. Healthcare, 7.12. Telecom, 5.48. Industrials, 4.87. Consumer staples, 4.23. Utilities, 1.24. And basic materials and energy, 0.96%. The top companies by weight in the NASDAQ 100 as of September 30th, 2023, are as follows. Number one, Apple, two, Microsoft, three, Amazon, four, NVIDIA, five, Meta Platform, six, Tesla, seven, Google A shares, eight, Google C shares, nine, Broadcom, and 10, Costco. So by the way, of that top group, Apple is 10%, Microsoft is nine, Amazon is five, uh, NVIDIA is 4.34, Meta is 3.78, and Tesla is 3.21, Google is another 6% of that. So out of those, there's a large, large group that are just focused on the top. It seems kind of like the S&P 500 is. So um, let's see, there's special rebalancing. Um, NASDAQ undertook a special rebalancing of the NASDAQ 100 index on July 17th, 2023. The the component company's weights were rebalanced to address over-concentration in the index and make it less dependent on just a few large companies. NASDAQ rules state that if stocks with a weight of more than 4.5% in the index collectively account for more than 48% of the index, then the index must be rebalanced. NASDAQ has only undertaken special rebalances twice before, once in 1998 and another time in 2011. The latest special rebalance was triggered by a recent rally in tech stocks and Tesla shares, which pushed the aggregate weight of the top five companies, which were Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, and Tesla above the 48% threshold. The special rebalance reduced their weights and increased those of other companies like Alphabet, Meta Platforms, Netflix, and Costco. The special rebalance will impact the performance and volatility of the index and the individual stocks as some investors may adjust their portfolios to align with the new weights. However, This is likely to be temporary as the rebalance does not affect the fundamentals or prospects of of any of the companies in the index. What is the difference between the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500? Well, it's pretty obvious. There's 100 companies in the NASDAQ and there's 500 companies in the S&P 500. So both indicate the market's performance. Overall, broadly, I like that. You'll hear their latest closing numbers and the most national news and summaries like in financial news and in newspapers and things like that. Um, there, but the differences between the two um, 
are that the NASDAQ can include foreign companies while the S&P 500 is only for U.S. firms. So there's a big difference and distinction there. Additionally, the NASDAQ excludes companies from the financial sector, which is not the case for the S&P 500. And finally, uh, again, just uh, 100 companies versus 500 companies. And, um, and there you have it. Bottom line is NASDAQ 100, uh, I do like... Uh, the index, you know, focuses on the largest 100 non-financial companies uh, trading on NASDAQ exchanges. It's a diversified index providing a broad overview of the market covering a variety of sectors, which we all like. Investors seeking broad exposure. Some of the world's largest companies can invest in the index via ETFs, mutual funds, futures and options or annuities. So there you have it. All right. I hope you enjoyed this like not so random walk down <laughs> Wall Street, if you will, with the with the S and P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the Nasdaq, and the Na- the Nasdaq Composite Index, uh, and the Nasdaq Exchanges, as well as the Nasdaq 100. So I kind of covered all three there. Educational in nature. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll look forward to seeing all of you in the new year in 2024. And uh, it should be very, very interesting. We got an election coming up and all kinds of things happening. And we'll keep you posted here on the Northbound Wealth Podcast.